Hello everybody, I'm Thomas. Welcome back to another video. This time I'm back with the sixth episode of my series, Let's Roll Up a Dungeon, where today we will be rolling up a dungeon using the RPG 2D6 Dungeon. So 2D6 Dungeon is an RPG created by Toby Lancaster, and it is this solo pl uh, player dungeon crawling game that includes a full rule set for the actual like character creations, monsters and all of that, but also includes dungeon generation rules, which is the main thing I will be going over today. So in like my normal fashion, I will first go over the source material for generating a dungeon. Then I will go over the outline I have prepared for today's dungeon. And then finally, we'll get to rolling up a dungeon. So for 2D6 Dungeon, I haven't actually read through most of the RPG itself, but I have actually heard really good things about it. So I really want to try it at some point in the future, but today we're just going to go over the dungeon generation rules, which is actually not too much. It's about, I have three pages here um, for at least the core mapping and dungeon generation rules. So for generating dungeon rooms, uh, the first step is getting a piece of paper. They recommended just using a dot grid paper, which there are some copies in the back of this book. And they say to draw a border that will designate the outer edge of the dungeon known as the outer boundary. It needs to be at least 20 squares by 20 squares, but is recommended to make it as large as possible. Because the smaller the dungeon, the fewer the rooms. Uh, this part we're not really gonna do today. I'm just gonna draw it on my iPad still on my grid paper and I'll just kind of limit the dungeon size based on how many rooms this dungeon's going to be. Uh, so next you select a square at the base of the grid and draw in the verticals with an opening at the top, connecting the four dots, and this is the entrance of the dungeon known as the entrance square. After that, you roll 2d6 for the room's dimensions. You make one of the dice the primary dice for the x-axis, and then the secondary dice will be for the y-axis. So. The two numbers create a box which represents the room as seen below. Uh, you attach the room to the starting square at any point you see fit. It does not have to be centered. There are a couple of additional rules for just the entrance room that you kind of need to follow. So by design, it has nothing in it. The entrance room is never too small or too large, so it will always be at least six squares and no more than 12 squares. Uh, it also will always have three exits. All will be archways and just you have to kind of keep that in mind. So. You see here for their initial dungeon roll, they in this example, they rolled a five and a three, which would be 15 squares total, which is too large for the entrance room. So they shrunk it down to a three by two. And then you can see they have the three different archway exits coming off of that entrance room. And then they have their entrance square down there. So after you roll the 2d6 to get the room dimensions, if you roll double, you roll again. Um, apart from a double six, you also don't do this for the entrance room. So. If you roll a four and a four, you roll them again, and then whatever the new results are, you add them to the previous results, because this way you can get uh, some larger rooms in your dungeon. And so you can see in this example up here, they rolled two fours in this example, so you roll again. In this case, it's not the starting room. Uh, and then they rolled a three and a two, so that gives a total dimension of a seven by six square room. So next it talks about how the rooms are kind of labeled. So you basically have small rooms and large rooms. Small rooms are just rooms that are six squares or smaller. They're considered small rooms. Uh, they can also occur if the room ends up being six squares or smaller due, position, due to positioning, like based on the outer bounds. Um, in this situation, you roll on the level rooms table when you're actually stocking the rooms with stuff, which we're not gonna do today, but you would roll on the small rooms table. Uh, the other thing to note about small rooms, which it mentions at the end here, is that all exits for small rooms are just archways. So these can think of be more of like transitional spaces that spaces that may have features of larger rooms, but more often than not are just merely junctions. So for large rooms, if a double roll results in the room of 32 squares or larger, the space is considered a large room. So when you roll on the room table, you would roll on a large room. Uh, larger rooms have different functions, encounters, and exits. So for corridors, um, if you roll a one when rolling for room dimensions, that's not including if you roll double ones, you have rolled a corridor instead of a room. So you kind of go through the same process for the X and the Y, and you can kind of just place the corridor wherever you see fit. Uh, the main thing to note is that uh, you roll for a number of exits still as you would for a room, but all exits from a corridor are always archways. Uh, corridors do not have encounter rolls, 
which is not really going to worry about for what we're doing and are not considered to be small rooms. Um, you always place exit squares on corridors as if they were rooms, so the open end of a corridor can either be closed off or used as an exit. Uh, this step here talks about some restrictions on where you can place the room. It's pretty much up to you, but it cannot overlap with other rooms. When you hit the outer boundary of the dungeon, the room stops and the boundary becomes the border of the room. Uh, you can butt up against other rooms. Corridors can end at the outer boundary, but exits cannot be placed on the outer boundary. Uh, next up is establishing exits for the room. So to do this, you roll a D6. If it's a one, there are no exits. A two or a three, there's one exit. A four or five, there's two exits. Or on a six, there are three exits. Uh, there's a variety of types of exits that can appear in the dungeon. Each room listed on the table will indicate the exit type and column. Uh, sometimes they'll just say random, which in that case, you just roll on the exit type table for the current level and apply all the exits apply that to all the exits in the room. So for this, I actually will go over the exit table later, but I'm pretty much going to roll on all of the exits that I need to, um, and I'll just apply that for the whole room. Uh, next up, as far as where to place the exits, um, there are a couple of restrictions. It recommends only having one exit per wall, and if you want to further randomize it, you can roll a d6, and then on a one or a two, it's the first exits on the first wall clockwise of the entrance, a three or the four, it's on the second wall clockwise from the entrance, or five and six, it's on the last remaining wall. Uh, there are a handful of restrictions when it comes to placing an exit. Each type of exit has a specific icon. Um, there's not always an exit. Sometimes you'll just roll a dead end. You cannot place an exit on a wall you entered from. Instead, you just skip past it to the next available wall. You cannot place an exit on the outer boundary of the dungeon. Instead, you just skip past it. An exit would lead to a space one square from a wall. Just don't add it. Uh, you cannot place an exit on a wall that already has an exit, and you can have a maximum of three exits in a room. Uh, and also, if you have any extra exits you cannot place, you just ignore them. Uh, then at each exit, you basically just make a square for making that the exit square, which you'll start jittering stuff off of uh, further down the line. Um, if there's not space on the map to draw the new room dimensions, you just draw the room to fill in the available space with the dimensions of the roll. Uh, rooms in the dungeon are either just rectangular or square, and occasionally you will have a room that uh, extends out in front of another room where no room has been generated. Uh, feel free to connect up these two rooms. It will mean an exit has already been added to the room when you roll for the number of exits. And that's pretty much it as far as the base mapping out rules. There are some extra rules for how to handle different levels of the dungeon, which isn't something I'm really going to worry about today. So the last thing I'll go over real quick is the exit tables, which there are two of, and they're, they look pretty much similar. Um, I'll probably just, I don't know, roll some dice to decide between the two, and then I'll just roll on that one. Um, but as you can see here, you have everything from wooden doors to archways, metal doors, curtains, um, porticolis, all the classic door stuff. And then you have like some that are locked, some that aren't. So it'll kind of mention that on these tables. But these two tables are what I'll be rolling on if I need to roll up some exit type. And that's pretty much it for what I'm gonna go over for today for 2d6 dungeons. So let's real quick hop to the outline and I'll go over that. All right, today's dungeon will be the Mirage Fortress. It's going to be a medium sized dungeon. So about 10 rooms or so. Uh, as far as the type tags, it's going to be a palace and kind of a base. As far as the detail tags, it's going to be mainly arcane and desert. And for the purpose, the Mirage Fortress was originally built as a palace for a powerful illusionist king who sought to protect his domain with a blend of real defenses and deceptive magic. Over time, as the kingdom fell, the fortress became a legendary repository of illusion-based magic and artifacts sought after by mages, treasure hunters, and those wishing to master the art of illusion. As far as the history, it was constructed centuries ago by King Alaric the Enchanter. The Mirage Fortress was both a symbol of his reign and a testament of his mastery over illusions. After his mysterious disappearance, the fortress was believed to be lost in the desert sands. Rumors persisted of a place where reality was fluid and the line between truth and illusion was blurred. The fortress re-emerges periodically, drawing adventurers and scholars alike to unlock its secrets. As far as the factions for this, I came up with two different ones. The first one is the Mirage Seekers, which are a group of adventurers and scholars dictated to unraveling the mysteries of the fortress. They seek knowledge and the lost magic of illusion. 
And then you have the Sandbound Guardians, which is a nomadic tribe who consider the fortress a sacred place charged with ensuring that its secrets do not fall into the wrong hands. As for some creatures and enemies you might encounter here, first up you have is Illusionary Phantasms, which are ghost-like entities that cause fear or disorientation, but are intangible and cannot be harmed by physical means. Next you have the Trickster Sprites, which are mischievous and small magical beings capable of casting minor illusions, often leading adventurers into traps or dead end. Next, you have Shifting Sand Beasts, which are large, amorphous creatures that emerge from the sandy floors, their forms constantly changing, making them difficult to battle effectively. Next, you have False Treasures, which are these animated objects mimic valuable treasures or items, enticing adventurers only to reveal their true monstrous nature when approached. And then finally, you have the Echo of King Alaric, a powerful illusion that embodies the fortress creator capable of manipulating the environment and casting complex high-level illusions. As for some quest hooks, first quest hook is called the Vanishing Scholar, which says a renowned historian specializing in ancient illusions has gone missing after embarking on an expedition to the Mirage Fortress. The players are hired to find the scholar, navigating the fortress's deceptive corridors to uncover what happened. The next quest is called the Illusionist Heirloom, which says the uh, rumor has it that a powerful artifact called the Prism of Alaric lies within the depths of the fortress. The artifact is said to enhance the control um, illusion magic profoundly. So the players must retrieve it before it falls into the wrong hands. And then the final quest is called the Mirage Tournament, which says a mysterious invitation is sent to various adventurers, mages, and thieves, challenging them to navigate and survive the Mirage Fortress for a grand prize. The players must outwit both the forest, the fortress and their competitors. As for some additional detail about the place, first up for condition and lighting, it's probably pretty well preserved, all things considered, um, especially on the inside. There's probably a lot of illusions going on to make it look well preserved, even if it's not. Uh, it's also probably really disorienting with stuff changing around and stuff not looking as it seems. And with just some inconsistent lighting, once again, probably part of the illusions that some rooms may be lit while some just unlit and it kind of just depends on the room. As for sounds you hear, maybe you'll hear the occasional distant sound of laughter or soft music. Creaking and groaning of the shifting structures could also be heard throughout the palace. Um, next for smells you might uh, smell, well, the air carries a mix of aromas, often incongruent with the surroundings. So this is a place of illusions, so you might be in a library and smell a garden, or you might be in a garden and smell of a fire. Like it's probably just all, kind of all over the place. And finally, as for the temperature, uh, the temperature within the forest fluctuates subtly, but is mostly hot. This, temp this fortress is found in a desert, so it's probably going to be pretty warm. And finally, some rooms I have prepared for today. First off, you have the shifting entrance hall, which says walls and doors constantly reconfigure, requiring clever observation to find the path forward. Mirages of menacing creatures may appear, but are harmless if ignored. Next, you have the Oasis Mirage, which is an indoor garden that appears as a lush oasis, uh, complete with water and trees. However, most of the, it is illusory, and navigating it requires discerning subtle clues to what is real. Next, you have the Banquet Hall of Endless Feast, a grand hall with a feast laid out, but food and guests are mostly illusions. Uh, one dish, if found, can heal or provide magical benefits. Next, you have the Library of Lies, books that tell twisted versions of history or false spells. One book, however, holds the key to understanding and manipulating the fortress's magic. Next, you have the Chamber of Whispers, a seemingly empty room where voices uh, whisper secrets and riddles. Answering a riddle correctly reveals hidden compartments or passageways. Next, you have the Galleria of Statues, a gallery filled with lifelike statues that are rumored to be adventurers petrified by an ancient curse or powerful magic some of which may still be sentient. Next, you have the Hall of Mirrored Echoes, a vast hall lined with mirrors that not only reflect images, but also past events and possible futures, creating a disorienting maze of time and reflections. Next, you have the Gallery of Frozen Moments. The gallery exhibits scenes of historical events, each frozen in time. Some scenes may come to life, replaying moments of triumph, tragedy, or revelation. Next, you have the Throne Room of Illusions, the heart of the fortress where the illusionist king's presence is still felt. Here, players face their greatest fears or desires manifested through powerful illusions. 
And then finally, you have the Vault of Echoes, the final room containing the fortress's greatest treasures, but each item is duplicated multiple times. Only one set is real, and choosing wrongly could have dire consequences. So that is the Mirage Fortress, and with that outline all out of the way, let's roll up a dungeon. All right, so I've drawn up a little starting square here, just kind of a random spot, and then we'll go ahead and start with the entrance room. So we'll see what we get. I might have to change this a bit. Yeah, so that's going to be too small, but I could just eat, change each of these by one. So instead of a six by one, I'll make it a five by two room. That way that fits the size for the entrance room. All right, so here is the entrance room all drawn out with the three archway exits. And we'll go ahead and just start with this left exit. So let's see what kind of room this is going to go into. Uh, and I guess it's a corridor. So I'm always going to treat the blue dice as kind of the X and then the Y, the white dice as the Y. So this is going to just be a five square long corridor. So next up real quick, we'll see how many exits this corridor has. So a four double check I believe that is two exits yes that's two exits um okay so since we already have this exit going that way that's the entrance we'll probably just do one going up and one going down so it's one two three four five since it's six long we'll just kind of roll for it so we'll put one way down there at the top and then the other way down here I guess going this way I'll maybe make it one space of a gap there so we got something like that um, I'm going to hop back to the starting room and kind of try to finish these before I start going off too much into other rooms. So let's go with this top room here and see what's going on there. And that is going to be a two by six sized room. Okay, so it's this kind of long looking room. Uh, let's go ahead and see how many exits it has. So that's a five, so that's going to be two exits. So then let's roll to see where they're going to be. Uh, the first one looks like it's going to be on this wall. And then the next one will be, I guess, on the right wall. So on the left and right walls. I guess we can also roll to see where they are. So the left one is going to be at the top. And then the right one will be kind of towards the middle. Okay. And since we have some exits now, um, I'd like to roll to see what kind of exits they are. So let me roll this to see what table I'm going to roll on, whether it's one or two. And that's in the first half. So I'll make that one. And then I will roll to see uh, what kind of exits both of these are. So that's a five and a six, which means they are both wooden doors. Okay, got that room all drawn up. So let's see what's going on to the right of the entrance room now. So rolling this up, that is going to be a five by three square room. All right, then let's see how many exits there are in this room. There is going to be three, so pretty much one on every wall so let's see roughly where this top exit's going to be i guess right at the end let's see where this one's going to be over here i guess that's going to be kind of right in the middle and then this other one will be towards the beginning okay then let me roll this to see which exit table i'm going to roll on that's going to be exit table number two and then let me roll these to see what kind of exits we have in this room so a one and a four means all three of these exits are just archways Okay, well now that I have these areas kind of surrounding the starting area figured out, we can start branching out a little more. So let's start with this room above the one I just created and see what the size of this is going to be. And it looks like it's going to be a corridor that is going left or right. Maybe just because I don't really care which way it goes, I'll roll a d6. So if it goes bottom half, I'll go left or top half, I'll go right. So that's a two. So this is going to go to the left. And real quick, see how many exits this corridor has. So that's a three, which means it has one exit. Um, yeah, I guess we can see what wall it's on. So starting with this wall, um, I guess we'll just make it on this top wall, actually. I'll kind of just make that decision. And then I'll roll a d6, I guess, just to see where the exit is. And we're going to kind of put it right at the end here. So then let's continue this corridor down to the left here and see what it leads into. And it looks like, I guess, another corridor, um, this time going up. Or it could be going down. Um, though I kind of like the idea of it going, well, we could just make it go down. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I'm going to make that decision that, well, hold on. You know what? We'll have this corridor go up because I think that makes a little bit more sense. Uh, yeah, because then it could like lead into a room that 
maybe this connects with or maybe that'll just be a corridor that connects over that way uh then we need so many exits to have which this isn't a very big room so i can't imagine it having very many apparently it has two exits um okay so we'll probably do one going down this way and i guess one going across that way because that's the only way that really makes sense so let me draw that out i think technically this is supposed to be a dead end here but i kind of like stuff looping around so i'm gonna go ahead and erase that just so that kind of it's a nice little loop going there uh, and then i guess i'm curious what's to the left of here if there can be anything so let's see what the dice say and it's another corridor this time going up six okay then i guess real quick let's see how many exits there are so that's a four that means there's two um okay so i think we'll just put one on each wall and i think i'll just make the executive decision that there'll be one right here that connects to that wooden door and then let me just roll to see where the other one's going to be on the right i guess which i guess is going to be towards the top got a lot of corridors going on i hope it was just like there's gonna be a big room here or something so i'm gonna go with this far right corridor going up there and seeing what that's gonna give me there we go so that is a six by three room which i think is actually perfect for this area i guess we can roll exits for this room but there's already kind of Technically, there's two. There's an entrance and two exits, or something like that. So we'll see. That that says no exits. So we'll kind of just keep that as is. Okay. Uh, let's go with this area to the right and see what's to the right of this room. And it looks like it's a corridor that is going up and down. I think I kind of mentioned I'm not doing the whole boundary thing with this. So I'm going to, even though my starting point is there and I really shouldn't be able to move past that if I was playing rules as written, I'm just kind of doing it my way. So I'm having this corridor extend further past where there would be a boundary. So let's see how many exits there are in this corridor. Apparently there are none. So it is just wherever this is going. So let's see where it's going with another room roll. And this time we get a three by two room. All right, let's roll to see how many exits there are in here. And that's a five, so that means there's gonna be two exits. Also, since this is a small room, uh, it all the exits will automatically be archways. So let's real quick see what uh, the exits are. So there's gonna be one on the left wall and that I already rolled that, so I gotta re-roll. This apparently can only roll twos. Uh, so we have one on the left wall and one on the right wall. Okay, well, let's continue off of this small room here and this corridor going to the left and let's see what's there and maybe if it'll connect up there, which I would say this will because that is a six by five room. Okay, well, that kind of ties up that area pretty nicely. And then let's go ahead and see how many exits are in this room. Uh, that is a five, so there's two exits. I'm just gonna minus that by one since there's already kind of another door coming into this room. So we'll see if that's the starting area. We can't do that roll. Okay, that works. So there's an exit on this opposite wall. So if I were to make an exit there, that'd kind of lead towards where the dungeon's entrance is, which I don't love. So I think I'm actually just going to forego that other exit for now. So let's hop back to this corridor over here and see what's going on there. So let's go for uh, the bottom area coming down from that. And that is going to be another corridor going up and down. Okay, I guess we can roll exits for this. Seems kind of silly, but there is one exit. So I'll just see which side it's on. So we'll say it's going to be on the right side, but that's gonna go towards the entrance. So I guess, you know what, execute decision, it's going left. So let's see what's down from this corridor. Probably another corridor, <laughs> it is, but this time it's going uh, left and right. So we'll make it, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, it's, it's almost long enough to fit back that way. And maybe I could do that, but I, I don't like the idea of running past the entrance. So we'll make it go to the left. Just been rolling up so many corridors, it's kind of crazy. Um, let's see what kind of exits this has. Thankfully, none. Let's see what's going on in this little corridor in the center there. Uh, a four by five room, which I definitely don't have enough space to do four by five, but I can make it a three by five. And that, well, now I can make it a four by, yeah, a four by three, I guess is what I, I'm gonna have to do. Okay, then we can see how many exits are in this room. Apparently there's three. So I guess two of them are probably just going to hit these corridors on either side, and then one is just gonna probably keep going straight through. Okay, well, that's kind of a weird area. Uh, let's see what's going on with this corridor kind of below there. I'm kind of curious. Uh, and that's gonna be a four by four room. 
Though, uh, since I hit doubles, I need to re-roll to see what size this room's actually gonna be. So I guess it's going to be a 10 by eight room. <clears throat> All right, let's see how many exits this place has. With a two, that's just one exit. So let's see which wall it's on. A six means it's on this far right wall, which doesn't really work. Um, so I'm just going to re-roll and that is a one. So it's gonna be on this top wall. Okay, well, let's see. These two corridors are now kind of uh, intersecting. So let's see what they intersect into. And that is going to be a three by two room. All right, well, that is a small room. Now let's see how many exits it has. And that is a three. So that means it has one exit. And then that means the exit, we'll count this as the entrance. Uh, it's gonna be on this top wall. All right, well, I'm gonna kind of hop around here. I kind of see what's beyond this wooden door over here. So let's roll that up and see what kind of room it's gonna be or corridor, but I guess it's a room, a three by two room. All right, let's see how many exits it has. It's gonna have three exits, so one on each wall. Okay, let's see what's below this new small room and maybe it'll connect up to that corridor down there. And it's going to be a four by three room, which looks like I can make that connect up. So if you count small rooms, then we've reached more than 10 rooms, but I think I'm gonna roll this up a little bit more and kind of maybe get a couple more bigger rooms. So let's continue with this corridor here and see what's going on there. And that is a six by five room. I might kind of get rid of that entrance so then those can kind of work. Okay, then let's see how many exits there are in this room. And I guess there are none, which is fine by me. So let's go, I don't know, let's go to this corridor area over here and see what's going on with this right there. And that is going to be a six by two room. All right, then let's see how many exits that room has. And apparently that one's going to have three. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do is, since this is pretty much the last room I want to do, I'm only going to give it two exits on either side, and then we'll kind of connect these up to some other stuff. So I'm going to connect up this uh, exit here to this kind of corridor over there, something like that. And then this, I think I will just, um, I'll have it also kind of come down and connect to this top part of this room. Something like that. I kind of like having it all interconnected, especially this whole area has got a lot of cool interconnectivity going on. Uh, what else? We have this kind of just open, which I'll probably just close off. I think the last open area that I can find is down here, which I'm also just going to close off. All right, so here's the whole dungeon. Let's go ahead and start labeling it real fast, and then we'll do a final dungeon walkthrough. So the first area makes sense that this is going to be the shifting um, entrance hall. Next, we have the Oasis Mirage, which I kind of envision that being a bigger room. So maybe we'll put that, uh, we'll put that over here kind of in the corner. Then we have the Banquet Hall of Endless Feasts. I imagine that being a longer room. So maybe we'll put that right up here. Uh, next, we have the Library of Lies. I envision this being one of the bigger rooms. So maybe we'll put that, uh, maybe up, we'll put it right here. We'll put it up here actually. Make that the library of lies next we have the chamber of whispers that's probably a smaller room so we'll just go with like that area there next we have the galleria of statues uh let's go ahead and put that up there and that's supposed to be actually six my bad seven is the hall of mirrored echoes but you know what maybe i will actually make that the hall of mirrored echoes and then i'll move the galleria of statues uh, down here to that room. Next, we have the Gallery of Frozen Moments, which I think will probably work good right there. Then we have the Throne Room of Illusions, which I think will make good for that room up top. And then finally, the Vault of Echoes will make this big room at the bottom corner. So let's do a final dungeon walkthrough of the Mirage Fortress. So you enter the dungeon here, and you enter into the shifting entrance hall where walls and doors are constantly reconfiguring require clever observation to find the true path forward. Mirages of medicine creatures may appear, but are harmless if ignored. You can go to the right and you'll end up in the Chamber of Whispers, a seemingly empty room where voices whisper secrets and riddles. Answering a riddle correctly reveals hidden compartments or passageways. 
Below that is the Oasis Mirage, an indoor garden that appears as a lush oasis, complete with water and trees. However, most of its illusory and navigating requires discerning subtle clues to what is real. Heading up north will hit you in room number four, which is the Library of Lies, where books tell twisted versions of history or false spells. One book, however, holds the key to understanding and manipulating the fortress's magic. Going north of that room ends you into the Hall of Mirrored Echoes, a vast hall lined with mirrors that not only reflects images, uh, but also past events and possible futures, creating a disorienting maze of time and reflection. Uh, going back to the starting area, going north of that, you'll hit the Banquet Hall of Endless Feasts, which is a great hall of feasts laid out, but food and guests are mostly illusions. One dish, if found, can heal or provide magical benefits. Then continuing uh, kind of up and left brings you into area six, which is the Galleria of Statues, a gallery filled with lifelike statues that are rumored to be adventurers petrified by an ancient curse or powerful magic, some of which may still be sentient. Kind of heading down into room number eight here, that is the Gallery of Frozen Moments. This gallery exhibits scenes of historical events, each frozen in time. Some scenes may come to life, replaying moments of triumph, tragedy, or revelation. Then you have this top left room here, which is the throne room of illusions, the heart of the fortress where the illusionist king's presence is still felt. Here, players face the greatest fears or desires manifested through powerful illusions. And then finally, this bottom left room, room number 10, is the Vault of Echoes, the final room containing the fortress's greatest treasure, but each item is duplicated multiple times, only one set is real, and choosing wrongly could have dire consequences. And that is the Mirage Fortress. So before I finish up here today, I will quickly tease out what's coming up on next week's episode. So next week, the RPG I'll be using is Derelict Delvers, which is a sci-fi RPG that I've done a playthrough previously on the channel. And since it's a sci-fi RPG, it's not going to be a traditional dungeon, but more of a space dungeon or more specifically a spaceship that you're going to be navigating. And I'm going to be uh, taking a lot of inspiration from the movie Alien and aliens so it's going to be a uh, kind of that style of dungeon where it's going to be exploring a ship that weird stuff is going on maybe people are trapped on and then different rooms will be kind of different rooms of the ship so that's what's coming next week thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed this video a like would be greatly appreciated and until next time i'll see you